thanks for coming. This is awesome. We have actually more people than last year to come to the Vision BOF. I know Vision is not necessarily central to SIGGRAPH, but it's becoming more so, so we're glad to, to see you here. And we're going to be talking about um, vision processing in general, what are the kind of the libraries and APIs that are out there. And in particular, we'll do a bit more of a deep dive into the vision API that Kronos is de developing uh, called OpenVX. I'm Neil, Neil Trevitt. Uh, I work for NVIDIA, and I'm president of the Kronos Group. And for those of you who haven't met the Kronos Group before, uh, we're an open consortium. Any company can join. Uh, we do low-level APIs for graphics, compute, uh, parallel computation, vision processing. And uh, we love people to come in, join, help us make the APIs that the industry needs. Uh, we have everyone from Google and Apple all the way down to small companies helping us uh, put these uh, APIs together. And vision processing is becoming more important for SIGGRAPH because it's a part of the visual computing loop. You know, it, SIGGRAPH, we're focusing mainly on the graphics process, which is taking data and turning it into pixels. Uh, but vision processing is, is the opposite. It's taking pi uh, pixels from a sensor, camera sensor, and turning it into understanding uh, and data that the application can use. And as we move forward into like an advanced augmented reality type applications, that glass, for example, is not there. That's a virtual glass, but it's interacting in very um, sophisticated ways with this environment. Uh, that, that's possible because of high performance uh, um, vision processing. And vision acceleration and vision processing is enabling waves of new uh, types of applications and use cases. We've had computational photography and computational videography for a while. But now it's becoming much more common to see cameras being used as input devices, uh, gesture processing, uh, body tracking. Uh, there have been quite a few boffs and sessions around I've seen on using cameras to reconstruct 3D models. And again, kind of the holy grail of vision processing in some ways is to look forward to a seamless integration of reality and augmentations in applications like uh, augmented reality. So, Getting to your acceleration cores for vision processing uh, is you know, obviously a vital part of developing any vision uh, app. And there are quite a few vision libraries out there. Probably now the best two known are OpenCV, which has been around for many years, uh, an open source project. And uh, up and coming is OpenVX from Kronos. But there are general compute APIs out there too. And it's a question we often get asked, which is why we've done this little introduction. Uh, should I use a library or should I use a general purpose parallel computation framework? And again, the framework that Kronos is developing is called OpenCL. So I'm going to start and spend just a few minutes kind of comparing and contrasting uh, what does OpenGL, OpenCL give you, what does OpenVX and OpenCV uh, give you. So hopefully that'll be useful if you're trying to make your own decision on what to use. So starting with OpenCL, it's a general purpose computation uh, framework. Um, it's designed so you can interrogate and find out all of the compute resources in your system. It can be CPUs, GPUs, but also DSPs, FPGAs, and even hardware blocks. And then you can write kernels in a kernel language which is primarily C, soon to be C++. And then you have the APIs that let you compile those kernels and distribute them onto any of the available processors and gather back the result. Now, of course, you can do anything you want in such a general uh, framework, and you can certainly do uh, vision processing. And it is, it's actually interesting to note that um, for many applications, like uh, autonomous driving, uh, driver assistance in the automotive industry, a, a lot of the vision processing is actually transitioning from classic vision processing pipelines to neural, neural net and deep learning-based uh, systems. And a um, parallel computation framework like OpenCL is ideal for uh, accelerating uh, neural net type functionality. To compare that to OpenCV, 
Uh, OpenCV was originally initiated by Intel many years ago. It's now an extensive open source uh, library. There are thousands of functions. You can do pretty much anything you can imagine uh, in OpenCV. Uh, it's put out there in a free, uh, free use BSD license. Uh, it's optimized in C, C++. Um, so I would say that the, the, the um, the main focus on OpenCV is exploration and uh, prototyping, and you can run OpenCV uh, pretty well uh, anywhere. That focus on the past hasn't been so much on figuring out how to accelerate it, but that's becoming more and more important to the OpenCV community. And they're using OpenCL, so it's actually quite interesting to see OpenCV and uh, OpenCL uh, begin to work together. So OpenCV 3.0, which is the latest version, has the thing they call the transparent API. So if an OpenCL implementation run, uh, a runtime, OpenCL runtime is available uh, on your system, uh, the OpenCV stack will take advantage of OpenCL and begin to accelerate uh, the available primitives that are coded uh, in the OpenCL framework. And uh, we actually had a very good conversation. We have a, a good, I mean, we, uh, Kronos is very supportive of OpenCV. It's complementary to OpenVX. And we try to have a good open dialogue. Uh, the convener for OpenCV is the chair of OpenVX, so the communities are very close. Um, and we kind of get say, well, how is OpenCL, how is this acceleration thing actually working out in practice? And you know, the straightforward state of the art is on desktop machines, um, PCs and Linux, the OpenCL is, um, layer is pretty robust and uh, you can get pretty reliable uh, OpenCV uh, acceleration. We're not quite there on mobile yet. There, there are lots of OpenCL drivers on mobile devices and if you're interested in that, this OpenCL BOF is next and it'll have, we'll have a lot more detail. Um, but the performance portability is not quite so easy on mobile. The mobile devices are slightly different in characteristics. The caching doesn't work out quite so, quite so portably. Um, but you know, we're working on it. So we're hoping over the next couple of years that even on mobile, uh, OpenCL and OpenCV will be a good, um, good pair. But the thing that's really driven OpenVX is the realization that um, OpenCL is great, but you have to kind of power up uh, your CPU complex and perhaps you know, a GPU complex. Uh, that's kind of the things that uh, OpenCL are built to do. But we have use cases like your augmented reality glasses you know, that we're all dreaming of in the future. That's going to need to be on all day, constantly scanning the environment with a thermal limit much lower than your phone. And that's a very hard thing to do. In fact, that's not actually really possible yet. So the challenge is to deliver vision acceleration at the next step down uh, in terms of power and much more power efficient. So how can we do that? Well, dedicated hardware is definitely going to be part of that uh, solution. Um, CPUs are great in general purpose, but if for, for, for vision and parallel compute, GPUs are more power efficient. And dedicated hardware, if well designed, can be yet more power efficient still. So we need to have some vision frameworks that are targeted for portability and extending that portability reach into low power dedicated uh, hardware for vision acceleration. And that's, that was the original uh, inspiration for OpenVX. So OpenVX is a kernel standard, so it's royalty free. It's available to anyone uh, to use. It's targeted at mobile, real time, low power, uh, applications, this gap we have in the ecosystem. But it's portable across any system that you would want to, to run it on. Uh, you can tap into uh, ISPs, you know, in image signal processors, dedicated hardware, DSPs, DSP arrays, GPUs, multi-core CPUs, uh, anything that you have available in your system. And the interesting thing about OpenVX is that once you set up the processing graph, which we'll get to in a second, you don't need a particularly high performance CPU. You don't need to have multi-core CPUs sucking battery. You, the graph maintenance can be a very low power uh, operation. And I mentioned the OpenVX graph. The graph concept is really the key to power efficiency in uh, OpenVX. 
OpenCV in its, in its standard state is a memory-to-memory -memory model. So if you have a, a vision operation like a filter or um, uh, some kind of you know, detector, um, OpenCV in default, you would read the whole image, you would do the, 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 the function processing, and then you would write the result back, and then the next uh, function would read the image again. Now, that constant round tripping to memory, uh, particularly on a mobile device, is, is very, very bad. Very, very bad. You don't want to do that because you don't have the bandwidth to start with, and that's the most power hungry thing you can do is read, be reading and writing at high bandwidth in and out of your memory. So, OpenVX has the concept of a graph which is expressed up front uh, before anything starts to, um, to execute. And the fact that the implementer is given the graph topology, uh, it gives the opportunity to the implementer to uh, to optimize how that graph is going to execute uh, in practice. So it depends on your implementation. You might want to coalesce some nodes together. If you're running on a GPU type device, a, a common technique is to slice the image into tiles and send tile size chunks that will fit into cache uh, so from input of the graph to output of the graph. So you avoid all of the memory uh, round tripping. So OpenVX and OpenCV are quite uh, complementary, comparing and contrast them. OpenCV is an open source. OpenVX is, is an API that's tightly defined with conformance tests. Um, OpenVX doesn't have the breadth of functionality of OpenCV. We're much more focused on the typical mobile applications. But OpenVX is extensible. So if you find some functions are missing, you can add them. And people will be adding functions uh, to the core specification uh, over time. People using OpenCV would typically you know, take the source code and port it onto their system. OpenVX is intended to be implemented by the silicon vendor and offered to the developer as a kind of a built-in library. Um, so just, you know, and they both have their strengths and weaknesses, uh, but OpenVX for low power uh, deployment. Now we're actually finding that OpenCL now is being used to uh, accelerate OpenVX. You don't have to use OpenCL, but it's certainly one uh, option that implementers have. And if you are running OpenVX over a GPU with an OpenCL uh, framework, then it can be a, a good way to get acceleration. So what we're finding is that people are uh, using OpenCL in some cases to code their nodes or their primitives and providing a, a, a full range of OpenVX primitives to their developers. And then the developers don't have to go down to the OpenCL level. They can stay at the higher level of abstraction, which is the OpenVX graph. And it's much simpler to work with OpenVX and plug pre-installed pre, uh, nodes together in your graph topology than it is to have to worry about low-level uh, OpenCL programming. So OpenCL and OpenVX are also uh, complementary. Uh, the general purpose of low-level OpenCL versus the high-level uh, graph-based topology of uh, OpenVX. You could not run OpenCL on a very low power core without triple e, IEEE floating point, but OpenVX lets you run on you know, any range of hardware, including that very low power uh, hardware-based uh, system. So in terms of the overall status, before I hand over, um, we launched the 1.0 OpenVX spec in October 2014, so OpenVX is still quite young. Uh, it's I know, less than a year old, so it's quite good to see momentum uh, al already building. Uh, we did a maintenance update to the spec in June. Uh, there's an open source sample implementation that you can download and try. Uh, we have a full conformance test suite and adopt as a program. The first conformant implementations are beginning to flow through that uh, program. You can see it's kind of a who's who of the, the vision industry uh, helping us uh, build and promote uh, OpenVX. So that's it for me. And we'll have time for questions at the end of the session. I want to hand, we have a number of speakers here. And Andrew Garrod from Samsung is going to be speaking about um, a related initiative at Kronos, a data format specification. And then Rada from AMD is going to be deep diving into the technicalities of uh, OpenVX. So let me hand over to Andrew. Thanks. This is a talk about communication. Um, and this is about the latest Kronos specification, which uh, I would love to say is terribly exciting because I wrote it, but actually it's extremely dull. It's a really simple thing. Um, so the good news is that some of you can go to sleep. Um, 
uh, except if you're writing a program that uh, works with pixels or with textures and that's stored in memory and uh, you need to do anything with that that other people might understand. Um, and if you have more than one type of that kind of thing, uh, or if you're dealing with hardware or anything like that, uh, in which case, uh, two minutes of your time, please. Um, so formats. Uh, we know what texture formats are. Uh, you've got some bits that correspond to pixels or textures or something like that. Um, and we want to describe what they mean. And a lot of APIs actually don't care what they mean. In something like OpenGL, it doesn't really care what the RGB channels are for. They're just called RGB. That doesn't necessarily mean red, green, and blue. Um, but maybe uh, you presumably do care. So when you say, I work with RGB, what do you mean? Well, um, what RGB? Maybe you meant obviously 32 bits, because that's the obvious thing to work with. Or maybe you meant obviously 16 bits, or a different 16 bits. Um, and maybe that order was the obvious one for you, and that's what you decided to use. But different APIs have different ideas of which order is obvious. Um, and you're doing this for a little bit, and then uh, it doesn't really seem to work. Uh, and uh, so you find yourself uh, trying to work around different implementations for a while, and then that happens. <laughs> um, so uh, then you decide that uh, you've actually worked out which pixels are which, and uh, it doesn't quite look right. So uh, you, you pick the standard colors to see what happens, and then you find out uh, which bit is in the right channel, uh, but you don't know what the channels mean. Um, so if you've got the obvious colors, that's fine. Um, but then maybe you've got the range slightly wrong, so everything looks a bit dim. Uh, or maybe you've got the gamma wrong, so everything looks a lot dim. Um, and uh, then maybe you've got things like sRGB to worry about, or you're outputting to a TV. Uh, and then there are lots of TV standards, because of course there are. Um, so you have to deal with all of those. And then you make a guess at what thing might seem obvious. Uh, and uh, it looks all right to you, and then one of your colleagues is trying to standardize it, and then that happens. Um, and then you decide, oh, it would be a good idea to support YUV, and then you realize there's more than one YUV as well. Um, in fact, there are a lot of YUVs, and then you try to use compressed formats as well, and then you try to use input from a camera, which turns out to be in a weird Bayer pattern, um, and there's a load of metadata, and it all gets quite complicated, and then you have a really intelligent application that you've worked everything out for, and you have a really intelligent API that you're trying to connect to to display all of this correctly, and then you plug in a stupid library in the middle that can't work out all of this, and all the metadata goes missing, and that's annoying. Uh, and so around this time, you realize that all of this is quite complicated. Nobody does this quite right. Um, and you end up doing that kind of thing. Um, so nothing does this right pretty much because everything concentrates on uh, just what you need for the problem space that you're working with. Um, GL knows what RGB is. GL understands RGB. GL doesn't need to know about all of this other stuff. For example, VX knows about um, some YUV formats, but doesn't necessarily know about camera formats at the moment, that kind of thing. Uh, and then at some point, you need to expand whatever API you're working with or libraries you're working with to handle other things. Um, and everybody thinks it's really simple, so everybody rolls their own. And then you try and make them talk to each other, and you find out what happens when everybody rolls their own because they're all different. Um, and then uh, you think that you had this little API that you wrote that wasn't doing very much, and then suddenly you find out that everything is interconnected. So uh, why am I standing here? There's a data format specification. It's just been released. Uh, this is the first big thing we've stood at and said about it. Uh, so we've said OpenVX is new. That's nothing. We're talking two weeks for data format spec. Uh, it is an extremely dull thing. It's the thing that everybody thinks they can roll their own for. Please don't. Uh, it's descriptive, so that rather than having a big enumerative list of what all your textures, uh, what all your formats are, uh, you can actually write general purpose code that can handle anything, including the wacky format that your manager is going to come and ask you to support next. Uh, it's extensible, um, so you can put in proprietary extra information. Uh, standard uh, hardware vendors can put in extra stuff. It's versioned, so when we made a mess of it, we can update it. Uh, it's flexible. It supports every format I could possibly think of, and I can think of some really wacky formats. Um, it's not big. It's uh, 
only a few pages. You can go and read it on the toilet. If you print it on soft paper, you can dual purpose that. Um, there are no conformance uh, tests for this. This is just a, a thing that Kronos is donating to the industry um, because we've been bitten and we'd like you not to suffer the way that we have. Uh, it's not tied to any specific Kronos spec. Uh, it's man uh, covered under the EGL group's auspices, but it doesn't rely on EGL. You don't have to care about Kronos to use this thing. And you can feel really superior because the press release went out a couple of weeks ago and absolutely nobody in the press knew what to make of it because they're not software engineers. Um, so this was my fault for uh, using practical effects at a SIGGRAPH, of course. But to avoid suffering in the same way that I've suffered with this kind of thing, uh, please take a look at the data format spec so you don't have the kind of problems that I've been having and I can never do this ever again. Thank you very much. So whilst Rod is plugging in, does it now any questions for Andrew? What's can you repeat the question? Uh, so, what does it mean? Was it, uh, that? Um, so, the, the idea is that so if you've met something like the 4CC formats list, where there's a, a, a list of ways that say this is. Uh, if you've got RGB in memory, then we have one format as a way of saying these are, um, uh, we've encoded red in the first eight bits and green in the next eight bits and blue in the next eight bits. Um, and then there may be a series of other enumerations that handle other different things. Um, that has one list that's not canonical and doesn't describe a load of useful stuff that you might want to know when you're trying to understand your data uh, and doesn't understand a load of compressed formats and that kind of thing. Um, GL has an internal list of what its formats might be. Um, OpenVX has an internal format list as well. Um, so I'm expecting every API to continue doing their own thing as much as they need to, but the idea of this specification is it's just a standard memory block that uh, lets you describe what you meant when you described a particular format, and then you can use that for documentation and you can use that for passing it between APIs so that everybody understand each and understands each other and we all get along. My name is Radha, Radha Krishna Giritskuri. I work for AMD, and I'm also a member of OpenVX working group at Kronos. So in this presentation, I'll brief you over OpenVX API with some examples to get you a sense of how the API looks. Right? So let's get started. OK. So OpenVX 1.0 specifies a framework and core set of vision functions that can be that can significantly accelerate by uh, can be accelerated by diverse hardware uh, ranging from completely programmable processors to a dedicated hardware pipeline that Neil was mentioning about you know, GPUs DSPs a wide range of platforms in there and it is intended to be used either directly by a computer vision application or as an acceleration layer to be used by uh, some higher level vision frameworks, such as OpenVX that he mentioned, or a lot of other frameworks that are going to come forward, and also be useful by some third party uh, vision engines or any platform specific APIs underneath. Um, when we are coming up with this spec, we had two main um, um, goals in our mind. And like any other open VX, uh, any other Kronos API, we wanted to come up with a standard framework that can be used on a wide range of platforms and also define an API in such a way that vendors have opportunity to accelerate to minimize the runtime overhead underneath there. So let, let's look at some more details here. Um, in terms of the functionality, it starts with supporting the basic data types that are very essential to computer vision. Now, it all starts with images. Um, um, they are all opaque objects, so they can be easily mapped to various kinds of hardware. Now, we have to support normal CPUs as well as go to GPUs and fixed function hardware, so you may not be able to access these uh, pointers directly from a host without having any particular API in the framework. Right? And in terms of the functionality, there are OpenVX 1.0 mandates, most commonly used functions for computer vision. Here are a few of them that are listed here. In terms of the computer vision process, for the image processing, there are basic 
pixel-wise, pixel addition, subtraction, multiplication, and logical operations. And there are various kinds of image formats that are supported here, going from RGB, YUV, into some just planar 8-bit, 16-bit images that may not, have, may not have any color correlation in there. And um, you may be able to convert the bit depth, being able to color, uh, convert the color from RGB to Luma or YUV. Um, and you'll be able to apply some filters, 2D filters and convolutions, such as you know Gaussian filter. You can apply box filter, morphological operations. You could resize images from different sizes. You could also apply some FN transforms, either FN transforms or you know perspective transforms when you kind of going from one size, one type of image to another type of image. Um, and Two data structures that stand out in OpenVX that are, one are pyramids and another one is an integral image. Pyramids are extensively used in computer vision algorithms. It is pretty much think about a, an image got scaled down successively going down. So to improve the performance, you perform operations at the low resolution and then successively go up scaling uh, the operations in there. Another one is integral image which gets used in object detection kind of algorithms. Um, to mention a few other uh, operations here, there are uh, feature extractions such as Harris and fast detectors, and there's optical flow. Um, so now, in terms of oral function, what Kronos defines is a, a, a basic framework and a basic framework that you, developers can use to create and manage graphs and also be able to execute graphs. And we kind of come up with 41 functional primitives that are um, widely accepted by the industry, at least the Kronos members uh, here. And then once, now, now, now the Kronos, now, now the vendors are, are free to extend this functionality, to add their own functionality. Once all the functions get accepted by the industry, we'll, it'll go back to the Kronos and we'll try to add more and more functions into the spec. Um, just to get started, uh, I want to give you start with a simple example so I can uh, uh, illustrate some of the terminology here. So here is an example where an image is coming from a camera, RGB, maybe, RGB image, and then we're going to detect some features, such as some kind of corners, and then display it, blend it, um, Overlay it onto the image and display it on a, uh, uh, in the output. Right? So here you can kind of see there are uh, an, an RGB is the image is represented using a VX image object, which is kind of an RGB image. And then at the bottom you see there's a VX array, which is a uh, called key points, where you have a, an array of XY coordinates, which kind of indicate what are the special points in the image that are of interest here. And then you see. Uh, the rectangular blocks here, which are called as OpenVX nodes, which are nothing but an instances of a particular functionality, which is an abstract node, which is an abstract function. Um, the one to notice is at the bottom there's something called Harris corners, which basically takes a, a Luma image, uh, which is a grayscale image, and then identifies the corner points in there, and then gives it an output to the array image. So overall, the points to note here is uh, there is a node, which is an abstract uh, functional block, instances of an ab abstract function. And there is a, uh, a there is VX image and VX uh, array, which are a pipe, kind of type of a data objects in OpenVX. And all these things is wrapped under an OpenVX graph that can be scheduled on any hardware underneath in there. And um, OpenVX objects are both strongly typed at compile time for safety critical applications and also are strongly typed at runtime for dynamic applications. You can kind of, uh, you can take an OpenVX object and then downcast it to VX reference, and that reference will have, it will retain the, what type of object it is, whether it's an image or an array or pyramid, depending on whatever that is, so for, for dynamic applications like that. Um, the, all these objects are very opaque, and the st strong uh, uh, types are very essential. If you kind of try to compare this with uh, uh, 
uh, OpenCL kind of a model where you have a memory object as a general object which can be used as an array or as an image. There is not much information given about the object to the framework, so the framework doesn't have much knowledge about how this object is being used. The fact that OpenVX defines various kinds of objects, now the framework knows about it, and implementation can take advantage of that knowledge to further optimize, because it knows the usage patterns, what the data represents, and things like that. And at a, at a high level, from the framework perspective, there is a context very similar to OpenCL, if you are familiar with, which basically is, uh, encompasses of all the objects that uh, reside under. And there are uh, other objects like VX kernel, which basically is an abstract uh, a function. Example is Harris function that you've seen in the previous example. You could have color convert functions. Um, all the functions can, are kind of abstract, can be represented as in VX kernel. And we went over the graph and node. Uh, let's skip the parameter for now. So I just prepared this slide just to give you a, an idea about how various objects look here in, in the uh, OpenVX. One is an image. Uh, as you're familiar, there are various data types that OpenVX supports, ranging from a single planar image of 8-bit or 16-bit or 32-bit uh, to a multi-planar uh, images such as IYUV or NV12. And also it supports interleaved formats such as RGB. And uh, you can kind of consider a pyramid as a, a multi-planar image, but pyramid has a particular semantic built into it, which basically says that each successive image, each, each successive plane represents a same image at a reduced resolution, which is scaled down using certain kind of uh, smoothing filter underneath. Uh, Besides pyramid, there is an array, which is a chunk of memory, which has a certain capacity. You can, at the end of a, a writer, a, a, a function that writes into an array basically can continuously um, add the elements to it. At the end, it basically tells you, at the end of writing, it tells you how many elements are in the array. Now, input to the array can pretty much read only up to that, and, and the capacity pretty much limits the, um, how much memory you can write into that. Uh, OpenVX 1.0 specifies certain data types that can be used as an array element. One is a key point, which basically pretty much specifies x, y coordinates, followed by some kind of strength and other metadata associated with it. And there are other items such as rectangle. If, if somebody writes a kernel that identifies, for example, faces, and you want to give an image, you want to give a list of faces, so it kind of can be represented as rectangular boxes in there. And Somebody can extend OpenVX to with their own data structure um, that I kind of mentioned that as a user-defined struct here. Um, what other classes are there? There's a scalar, which is kind of a very uh, atom, a, a primitive data type, such as integer scalar. Sometimes a some, lot of these functions take configuration parameters, such as some kind of a threshold or a strength uh, thresholds that can be represented using uh, uh, a scalar. Um, VX delay is a very interesting uh, data type, which is uh, which basically it contains a list of temporarily delayed objects, uh, which can be implemented using a recycle, uh, kind of a ring buffer in a kind of that goes in a round robin fashion. So at any given instance of time, imagine a kernel has access to uh, an object at t0, t minus one, t minus two, kind of going forward up to um, whatever the delay that you need to support. And when you try to process next one, you can kind of um, uh, increment the, uh, you, you can add a delay into that, so that way all the buffers will get shuffled around. Now then the kernel function will have access to this, all the set of functions with the same index going from zero to whatever count that is available in there. Uh, where does this get used? You can think of it in kind of optical flow, where you're kind of looking at the image at the current time frame and that image in the previous time so that it can look at the delta from previous to current. You can also look at it as a pyramids, for example. You want to look at a pyramid at the current time zero and also uh, uh, time t minus one. So that what it buys you is once you compute a pyramid, you can put it in a, this delay element so that way it kind of goes back and forth. You don't recompute the same object multiple times. Um, here is another depiction of the um, OpenVX framework. 
you can kind of see um, all the objects stay within the context. And there's one object that I, I introduced here, which is called a virtual data object. A virtual data object pretty much stays inside a graph, which is kind of for mentioning that this is an object that is temporary, which is not act, which won't be accessed by the end user. So what you're telling the framework is saying this object is not used by the user. You can allocate it wherever you want. And since it is not getting accessed by the user, uh, the underlying framework can fuse some functions, even get rid of this memory altogether. So it kind of gives a flexibility for each, all the vendors to be able to optimize more. And there are some extensions um, um, in terms of that can be provided by a third party building more kernels, kind of a loadable kernels that can be done here. Um, this is a lot of data here, a lot of points here, but I think one point that I want to mention here is the graphs are, have certain rules to follow. One of them is you cannot have cycles inside a graph. Um, that means the, the rules that uh, Cronus uh, Open we expect provides here is there can only be one writer for a data object. And a data can only be uh, uh, read after it has been written. Um, I think I'll have more details of his covered in some of the examples that are going to come forward. Um, now let's look at the graph life cycle. Um, you create a graph, and before you execute, you have to do something called you have to verify a graph. Now verifying a graph just means that you're asking the framework to say, I've constructed the whole graph, make sure there's nothing wrong with it in terms of all the consistency checks are made, all the data types that are given are supported by the underneath frameworks. And, and if there's any optimization that needs to do, now the underlying implementation can mark those optimizations and give it to the runtime when it tries to execute. Now for execution, there are two kinds of modes it supports. One is a synchronous mode, where you just say VX process graph. As soon as the function returns, you know that all the outputs are available. And the other mode is asynchronous mode, where you simply issue a kind of a submit or VX schedule graph, where you're simply telling the graph saying, start executing. And then the function returns immediately to the host uh, code. And now when you want so that the host code can continue processing something else, and when it wants to wait for the results, it can call simply wait for the graph. Um, now the thing here is once you verify, you can keep running the same graph again and again. Uh, the, the only time that you need to re-verify the graph is sometimes if you, you all of a sudden, let's say you give another um, you, you change the camera or your e image resolution changed all of a sudden, now you want to kind of ask the framework to verify it again because some, a lot of the assumptions that were made are not applicable anymore. It is a simple example that I took straight from the spec. Uh, in this example, you can see the input is a, a UI VY image, which is a YUV image in a 422 kind of decimation. And the output is basically a a, uh, gives you the edge magnitude. It basically runs a Sobel gradient, and then followed by, it looks at the magnitude, saying how strong the magnitude is, and also gives you a phase in there. And you can see the intermediate results here are virtual graphs, and, and it initially takes a UI and extracts the luma out of it, and then performs the smoothing, followed by gradients. And then on the gradients, it calculates the magnitude and phase, which is Magnitude is basically a square root of x gradient and y gradient. And in this particular example, you can see it starts by creating a context. And at the last line, if you notice, there is a release context. Now, you can say, you can think of this as the uh, life cycle of the context. Once you say release, all the memory allocated under this context will all be released. So you don't need to keep track of every object in there if all you want to do is just create once and then destroy it at the end. Right? And in this example, you can also see the, the images that are created here are UIVY, which is the input, and the 16-bit output, um, which is the S16 uh, for the magnitude. And there is a U8, is an 8-bit image used for phase, which is basically tells you 0 is for 0 degree and 255 is for 2 pi, close to 2 pi in, in there. And, and then it creates a graph. Inside the graph, all the temporary uh, buffers are created as a virtual image. Uh, but it's a virtual image. You don't have to specify 
the underlying framework can figure out what is the resolution of it. For example, if you give a UI VY image and ask to extract Luma, it kind of knows underneath that you know it is it's going to have the same resolution as the input, so it's going to fill in all the details in there. And then the way to instantiate nodes in a graph is there is a uh, VX uh, channel extract node. It has VX and the name of the kernel followed by a node, which basically tells you that in this particular first example, the channel extract insta gets instantiated in, in the graph with image zero, which is UIVY, as the input, and the output is basically the zeroth virtual buffer. So you can kind of see a graph getting constructed here. At the end of constructing the graph, it simply calls verify graph once, just to see there are no errors in there. And once the graph is verified, then you can issue the process graph call when you can actually call it multiple times to be able to run it several times for each image that it comes through. Here is another example. Now, this, this corresponds to the diagram that I've shown before the, the first page where you have the RGB camera connected in and it is trying to detect the uh, key points inside that RGB image. And, and the point that to note here is this is very similar to the previous example, except that let, let's look at the for loop, in the while loop in the execute graph. You see, before it, process, it, it calls the process graph, it is trying to copy the image, uh, the RGB image, into the uh, image object. And it uses the function call, uh, calls called VX access patch and commit patch. When you do an access patch, you get a pointer in the host. Uh, in, in the host uh, host address space, and it can be now the the image can be copied from the RGB image into the host, and then you say commit patch. Now you're giving the control back to the host. Now underneath it might result in thank you. Underneath it'll take uh, the framework will take care of copying the buffers to wherever the underlying hardware can access the uh, data to. And after the process graph, you use similar. Uh, um, functions to access an array. And one more thing to notice here is uh, the, the frame YUV and frame gray are not uh, virtual data. That means underlying um, graph optimizer cannot optimize much because since you said it is a, an, a data object that, can be, that a user can access, since the framework cannot make any assumptions, it won't try to optimize. So in this particular case, the color conversion will unnecessarily create U and V frames, which are generally not needed. Right. So as discussed earlier, graphs are very key for the efficiency. And uh, each node can be implemented in software or on the hardware. And it can be coded in any language, depending on uh, the underlying platform. Nodes may be fused, depending on how it is constructed. If you say there are some buffers are temporary intermediate, the underlying framework may be able to fuse these uh, nodes together. And the processing can also be tiled to keep data entirely in the local memory, some of the examples that Neil was mentioning in his, uh, in his presentation. OK, there are, some, there are some other key features in OpenVX. Uh, in terms of there are special image types. There is a uniform image, which basically says that all the pixels in the images are constant, and they're initialized at once. So what it, it does to the framework is saying the whole image is constant. Now, that when you create an image, underlying implementation may not have to allocate a huge buffer. It can, in theory, just keep one value and optimize underneath. And there are also images that can be allocated externally using a host malloc, and then pass the pointer. And it has other features such as callbacks, hints, directives, User kernels. User kernels are pretty much like kernels that a user can develop that runs on the host, uh, on the host uh, CPU. But it follows every framework in terms of verifying the graph. It follows all the guidelines that are dictated. There's a certain API uh, framework functions that user have to develop to create their own user kernels. And there's a VXU library, uh, which is pretty much easy way to get started. It's just a if you want to, all you want to do is call one particular kernel instead of creating a graph, it just gives you a small wrapper underneath, which creates a graph and then runs it automatically in there. There are th 
three extensions that are provisional at this moment. One is a tile extension, which is to allow the underlying framework to um, um, uh, split the image into small pieces and then run the uh, uh, graph in small tiles so that when a, when a user has a particular function implemented on a tile basis, it can just schedule it accordingly to take advantage of the local caches in there. And there is also a 16-bit extension that supports 16-bit uh, uh, operations such as, you know, 16-bit convolutions, 16-bit uh, Gaussian uh, op that operate on 16-bit images. So in, 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 in summary, OpenVX features functional and performance portable through tightly defined specification and full conformance, uh, conformance that Neil was mentioning before. It's also uh, defined to get a out-of-the-box power efficient vision acceleration. And OpenVX will be performance portable across diverse hardware. Um, and it is extensible to go beyond what is in the core specifications now. Right? Um, that's all I have. Cool. Thank you, Radha. So any questions for any of the speakers? Yeah. Can you find line certain uh all your jumps are pretty much in ratio? can you find line certain processes like in the first stage finishes a strike and leave what's kind of passive to the next stage, so you can parallelize the steps. Yes, yes, so the pipelining, so the, given when you specify a graph, you don't specify how to pipeline it? Can you the question? Oh, well, the question is, uh, um, can, will you be able to pipeline uh, if you have a graph that has multiple operations that can go one after the other, can you do a pipeline uh, while executing? Um, it's pretty much implementation dependent as far as the OpenVX specification goes. It does not constrain any of that. So an implementation can perform, look at a graph, and decide what's the best way to execute it. One of it could be pipelining. Another one of could be use, scheduling it on different hardware if it is available underneath. The question is, is there any performance comparison of OpenVX to OpenCV? Um, I don't have any publicly available data on that. Uh, Neil, do you have any? No, I think the implementations will start appearing in the next few months where we can start doing that kind of analysis. I think the, um, there's no guarantee that VX will be faster than CV, but if you have a good implementation that is using the graph optimizations, now the, the opportunity is there for implementers to go significantly faster by saving the round trips to memory. So um, it will depend on the implementation. So as I say, in the next, next few months, we would expect that kind of data to become available. I think there's one other question over here. Uh, what platforms are supported? Desktop, mobile? Yeah. So. The primary design focus for VX is definitely the low power mobile. I mean, that's where we're making decisions, you know, should we do, do A or B? You know, if, if we are focused on uh, the real time mobile vision applications, you know, that's where we would design towards. But in the end, there's nothing specific about VX that precludes it from running on any, any platform. In fact, it's just that that's where we expect you know, the, the, the first beachhead uh, adoption will take place because that's where the most urgent need is. Now, we, we might be wrong, but uh, no, there's no reason why you can't ship it on, on any machine, including desktop machines, if you'd want to. And we, the sample implementation that we have you know, will run on uh, desktop so people can develop there and then deploy on mobile. Thank you. Yeah, well, embedded, embedded real time. Yes, uh, Andrew says a good, good point. It's, um, 
automotive as well as em embedded. I mean, kind of include each other a little bit. But yes, automotive is probably the biggest market opportunity for deployed vision processors in quantity right now. OK. You uh, in your slides, you mentioned uh, uh, kernels in a graph can be fused. So is there any rules you suggest? Or is a, a device independent? Yeah, that, that's very implementation dependent. For example, if I, oh, let me give you an example. Uh, let me take the last example that I got here. Could we switch back to the slides, please? Yeah, if you, if you take an example here, in this part of the image where it computes the gradient, where it has the gradient x and y coming out, in theory, it doesn't have to store the image right into the external memory. It could just uh, get the gx and gy, and it could do a square root to, to get the distance out of that. It can also do an arctan kind of an operation immediately and store the results right here. So you can kind of see it's kind of it could fuse those together and then write it out. Okay, we're at the end of our time for this buff. Thank you very much, everyone, and thank you to all the speakers. Thank you.